الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا ابي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقيه الله في الارضين اجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من اعوانه وانصاره ان شاء الله this is our seventh session in our series on contemporary issues in Islamic thought. And alhamdulillah, so far we have been able to cover feminism, pluralism, secularism, interfaith dialogue, Muslim-Christian relation, and Sunni-Shia relation. Today, inshallah, we want to study, of course, very briefly, in just in one session, the issue of religion and freedom. What is our understanding of freedom? This is a very important issue. Of course, it has always been important, the issue of freedom, whether in philosophy or in social sciences. But of course, in our contemporary time, it's much more important and necessary for us to know what is the Islamic view about the issue of freedom. Uh, first of all, we should uh, start with some kind of understanding of freedom. What do we mean by freedom? Because there are different aspects of freedom. Uh, one type of freedom is philosophical or metaphysical freedom, something that philosophers and also theologians study to see whether human beings are free or not. It means that can they choose what to do or everything is predetermined, everything is fixed in advance. So for example, if I want to do something, I want to go somewhere is it really me who decides or it's already built inside me that I must do this? Or God creates the actions in us. This is the historical issue of free will, which is studied in philosophy and theology. And of course we believe in human free will and we believe that God has created us free to choose what to do, what kind of person to become. Allah has shown us the way, the path, and it's up to us to be thankful or to be unthankful. And there are many discussions in philosophy about this, many discussions in theology, and Rumi just in a couplet tries to uh, reflect on this issue and remind us of our own innate understanding. He says, In ke gu'i in konam ya an konam khud dalil ikhtiyar ast ay sanam. The fact that sometimes you are faced with two or more options and you ask yourself whether I should do this or that. This by itself is a reason for freedom. If we were not free, we wouldn't have been wondering what to do. The fact that we wonder what to do, the fact that it takes us time to make up our mind, and sometimes even in the end we don't know what to do and we go and ask other people, this shows that we are free. We are not like a person who is falling down from top of a high building and he cannot stop. He's going down and he cannot control himself. We are not like that type of person. Uh, I don't want to discuss that much about this type of freedom because I think this is, first of all, not very difficult to understand. And secondly, it must be studied in philosophy, not in our short course on Islamic thought. The other type of freedom which is important is 
freedom in thinking, freedom of thought. Of course, if you don't, don't believe in the first freedom, then there is no chance to talk about any other types of freedom. Freedom of thought, freedom of belief, freedom of, for example, expression, freedom of uh, political exercise. All types of freedom, all are based on acceptance of metaphysical or free, philosophical freedom. If you believe human beings are f determined and are forced philosophically, so there is no way to talk about other types of freedom. But because we accept that, and that is our uh, beginning point, our departure point, so we can now talk about other types of freedom. Freedom of thought, what does it mean? It means that does Islam a law or even encourage people's freedom in thinking, in studying, in trying to find out what is the true decision, what is the true judgment in respect to religion, in respect to science, in respect to morality, in respect to human affairs, so on and so forth. Or Islam bans and says, no, you shouldn't think. You must only believe in what we tell you. There is no chance for any kind of reflection and thinking. It is very obvious that Islam not only allows but also encourages and urges us to think and reflect. Tens of times in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks human beings to reflect and to ponder. And sometimes when people reflect, when people think, may not come to right conclusion. But still we should encourage people to think. Still we should encourage people to reflect. But at the same time, of course, they should increase their knowledge. They should learn by benefiting from the experience of the people who are more knowledgeable, more learned. But we should not say, because some people may end up with wrong conclusion, so it's better to ban it from the beginning and say, no one should think, no one should ask, no one should study. No, this is not the Islamic way of uh, treating the issue of human thought. The late Shahid Mutahari has very beautiful discussion about this, and he says that when we reflect on the history of Islam, we find that Islam has always made progress whenever there was such a freedom in Islamic society. When people who were in charge, either statesmen or the theologians, were the people who were allowing free scientific discussions. People allowed people from different schools of Islam or even people who were not maybe Muslims to think, to discuss. This is very important. You remember what we told last week about Imam Sadiq salam having discussion with the people who were atheists. The story of Mufazzal. And he was never getting angry with them. He was always letting them bring all their arguments. And then, of course, Imam was giving them the answer. Or, for example, you know, we had many cases in the uh, time of other Imams, even the Prophet وسلم, when they let people of other faith or no faith to come and ask serious questions about Islamic faith. They didn't say, you must not say anything like this. They let them ask, and then, of course, they gave them the answer. But the fact that people listen to these conversations are very helpful. Of course, we should always 
tr uh, be trying to create opportunities so that people can get not only the questions and attacks, but also the answers. This is important. But we shouldn't say we don't allow people to question us, we don't allow people to criticize us. This is also wrong. So you need to do two things. Create opportunities for scientific, academic exchange of ideas without any hesitation, without any fear, because we believe that Islam is so strong that can challenge all these uh, critics. But at the same time, we should not say, okay, do whatever you want to do. We have other things to do which are more important for us and leave a vacuum to be filled by the people who are opposing Islam. So this is not something which is wise or reasonable. So this is the duty of Muslim scholars, Muslim thinkers, Muslim theologians to always reflect on these points and bring very powerful answers, very logical answers. This is important. But on the other hand, as far as others are concerned, we don't have any problem with others coming and asking, questioning, criticizing us, because we believe that Islam is a religion which is, salam alaikum, very much rational, very much able to cope with any kind of criticism, and then in the end, Islam would be the one that vict is victorious. So Ayatollah Mutahari says that if we study the history of Islam, we find that in those ages in which there was such a freedom in Islamic society, Muslims developed more in their Islamic thought, in their mm, development of Islamic civilization, and so on and so forth. And it is also re relevant to this issue of freedom of thought that in Islam, especially in the school of Ahlul Bayt, we have this idea that people should adopt their religion only after they make enough search for the truth, after studying, and after being able to support their faith with arguments. If someone comes and says, I am a Muslim only because my parents are Muslims, or because I was brought up in Islamic society, we don't accept this person as a real Muslim, as a true Muslim. Of course, we don't say you are not a Muslim, you know, because Allah knows, you know, how much that person has certainty or has knowledge. But as far as Muslim thinkers have told us and are concerned, in the, especially in the school of Ahlul Bayt, and you find it in the beginning of every manual, every risale, they said, when it comes to your aqidah, you cannot do taqlid. You cannot follow anyone else. You cannot say, I believe there is one God because my marja or my religious authority has told me this. I believe in the Quran because Mr. So-and-so has said this. No. Everyone, when it comes to his aqidah, must have his or her own arguments. And this story is very famous that once the Prophet وسلم, with some of his companions met a very old lady and she was uh, working with his uh, very simple machine, a kind of like sewing machine, but it was not really sewing machine, it was to produce thread out of wool, you know, they produce thread. And the Prophet asked he, her, how did you come to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists? She said, I know that my machine only works when I move the handle of machine. If I stop, the machine doesn't move. This world with lots of movements, this movement of stars and moon, all must be based on a mover without whom 
these movements cannot come into existence. So she had an argument for herself, which is very similar to the, one of the arguments of Aristotle, unmoved mover. The Prophet ﷺ after that said, Alaykum bidin al ajais. You should have your religion like the religion of old ladies. Which meant that, like this old lady, you must have some argument for your faith. You cannot just say, I am a Muslim and, you know, this is because my parents told me or my uh, a school teacher told me to be a Muslim. The other issue which is very much relevant is that in Islam, especially in the school of Ahlul Bayt, we so much allow and we so much encourage and indeed urge people to think and to have their own independent study to the extent that, first of all, we never banned ijtihad. In the school of Ahlul Bayt, ijtihad is always open. We don't limit ourselves to any jurist, to any faqih, any scholar, even if he's a great personality. We don't have this idea that we must either follow for example, Imam Abu Hanifa or Imam Shafi'i or Imam Malik or Imam Hanbal. No, we say, although these people were great people, but still every jurist must be able to reflect directly on the Quran and Sunnah and make his own decision. So in Shia fiqh, when someone becomes qualified, when someone becomes mujtahid, not only he is not required to follow any other uh, mujtahid, but also it's prohibited to follow any other mujtahid. So if you read, for example, the permissions that ulama give to their students when they become mujtahid, when they become qualified, they say, for example, from today, this person cannot do taqlid, must not do taqlid must have his own ishtahad. Why? Because now he's qualified. A person who is not qualified, he must follow another person who is qualified. This is rational. But a person who is qualified must be independent. Maybe he bet comes with better ideas. Maybe he can be better than his teacher. You cannot say always teachers are better than students. And this is the way that, alhamdulillah, we had this vitality in, in the Shi'i thought. We never get stuck with any alim. Although we respect our ulama and we wholeheartedly follow them. But when one, one of our marja dies, we go to the next living marja. Maybe he allows us to remain with the old or with the dead marja. But still it's he, the living one, who gives us this permission. So this vitality is very important. So we always have this exchange and this uh, shift to new ideas and new people. Of course, this doesn't mean that people should come with different ideas. Maybe the living marja has the same fatwa as the old marja. We are not after change. What is important is that we want new efforts. We want new brains to work. If they come up with the same idea, okay. Thanks to God, we have it in the first place. If they come with different ideas, again, thanks to God, because now we are in a position that maybe we can better cope with the requirements of the age. So this is very important. And when you go to the seminaries to hose us, you see that people, sometimes maybe maraja, sometimes uh, people who are junior ulama, they give lessons. There are tens, hundreds, sometimes thousands of people, and always engage in questioning and answering. And no one takes this as an offense. 
You can question your great teacher, and he allows you, and even if sometimes, you know, the a student don't make big questions, the teachers become very sad. Sometimes, you know, some ulama, when they saw that the a student didn't make questions, they criticized them and they said that this is not the majlis for Rosa. In Rosa, when someone is reciting matam, you should listen and then you cry. But when we teach, this is not Rosa. You must question, you must ask, you must be creative. There's a difference between preaching and teaching. If you are preaching, if you are doing mu'aze or you are doing, you know, matam, okay, people should listen. If they have questions later, but if there is teaching, you see that even sometime in the process of teaching, a student stops the teacher and asks. This is the tradition that we have in our hose, in our seminaries. Okay. The third type of freedom, which is a bit controversial, is freedom of belief, or what some people call today religious freedom, but as far as the belief part of it is concerned, not the practical part of it. What is Islamic view about people being free to believe in what they want? This is a very difficult question. We said we allow, we encourage, we urge people to think, to reflect. Do we also encourage people and allow people to believe in whatever they want? For example, if someone says, I want to worship idols. I want to worship cow. Should we allow them? Should we encourage them? Should we say, okay, because you are free, so do whatever you want, believe in whatever you want. What is the Islamic view about this? Here we should distinguish between two different positions. The position of Islam as, as far as Islamic thought is concerned, and the other is the position of Islam as far as Islamic governance is concerned. These are two separate issues. Sometimes people don't make distinctions. In other words, if you ask a person, a Muslim scholar, do you think that people are free to choose whatever religion they want, or even if they want to be an atheist? Philosophically, they are free. But Islamically, do you accept such a freedom? The answer is no. If people want to, for example, be free, and then they say we want to then be atheist. We say this is not a matter of your freedom. You must follow arguments. You must follow reasons. You cannot say, I want to be idol worshiper, because my parents were idol worshippers, and this is what I enjoy. No, we don't accept this. We said even we don't accept someone who is a Muslim because he is just following his parents. So how can we accept someone who is idol worshipper because he's following other people? Or just following superstitious ideas? No one is free to believe in something which is superstitious or baseless or stupid or harmful to human honor and integrity. But this is not the position of Islam as far as Islamic governance is con concerned. These are two separate things. So if you ask me, suppose I am a Muslim authority, if you ask me, do you endorse people who are, for example, atheists or idol worshippers or, for example, you know, worshippers of animals or, you know, stars or fire? Do you endorse? I say no. I don't believe in such a freedom. I believe that people must be free to follow their reason and what their reason says. 
But if, for example, I am a Muslim governor, suppose there is Islamic government, then are we going to force people so that people leave their other faith ideas and their beliefs? That is another issue. No, we don't do that. So we don't tell the people, we, because we must be very honest. We don't tell the people, it's up to you. Whatever you want to believe, it's okay. No, we say you must believe in something which guarantees your happiness in this world and in the hereafter. What is that? Let us discuss, let us study. In the end, something is true and something is false. You cannot say everything is okay. We are not relativists who say that it's up to you what to believe. It's up to you what to do. It's up to you what to decide. No, we believe that there are certain standards that we should follow. But if people for any reason follow other types of beliefs or they are basically atheists or they don't have any idea, it's not the responsibility of Islamic government to go and force them to become Muslim. So we must make distinction between these two and no one should accuse Islam of being intolerant. No, we are very tolerant but at the same time we are honest to humanity and we say that human beings must choose their face in a responsible way. It's not a matter of me saying, okay, I do whatever I wish. I believe in whatever I wish. No. I am sorry. You are not supposed to believe in whatever you wish. You are supposed to believe in whatever is rational. Whatever is based on sound and safe arguments. Not whatever you wish. Not whatever you desire. The other type of freedom is freedom in society in being able to choose the type of rule, the type of government, the type of policies that you like. No person must be forced to obey another person. This is very important Islamic view and I think this is the best <laughs> and the most one can say to safeguard freedom of people. Islam says all human beings are equal. Imam Ali salam told Imam Hassan in his letter, which is 31, in Nahj al letter 31, told Imam Hassan, Akram nafsaka an kull daniya, safeguard yourself from everything which is bad, which is ugly, which is disrespectful. Wala takun abda ghayrik, qad ja'alaka Allahu hurra. Do not be slave of any other person. God has created you free. God has given you such a valuable gift and that is freedom. Why you serve another person? Just because he is, for example, head of a tribe or because he is, for example, a king or he is, a, for example, a person who is supported by rich people None of these should make you be afraid and say, okay, I follow you. You are so great that I sacrifice my freedom so that you can be obeyed. No. Allah has created you free. The only one which, who, is, uh, who deserves really to be obeyed is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who doesn't want our obedience for his own sake, 
who wants our obedience for our own sake. And the people who are the people who represent the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the same. The Prophet doesn't want us to obey him for his own sake. If he asks us to obey me, it's for his own, uh, it's not for his own uh, sake, it's because of us, it's because of leading us towards the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, towards our happiness and uh, perfection. Like a doctor, like a physician who asks you, this is your prescription and you must follow this prescription. You must listen to me, you must trust me. Or a teacher who tells his students or her students that you must trust me. You must do your assignments. It's not for the teacher's sake, it's for the children's and students' sake. So that is different story. So we obey Allah, we obey the Prophet, we obey Imams, we obey our parents for the sake of Allah. Because we believe through this obedience, we can become a better person. But obedience of, to other people for their own sake, without guaranteeing my own good and interest, is something which is not acceptable. I only follow someone else if it fits into my interest. This is the Islamic view. Because I am free. So as a free person, I should follow any person or any arrangement or any system if that fits into my interests. Okay, if I myself sign a contract or for example I accept to become a citizen of another country and follow their rules as much as you know possible, that's a different story because then you are, fitting, uh, you are finding this fitting into your interest. So I'm not saying you must be a responsible citizen of where you live. But I'm saying that no one can force you to become our subject or our citizen or do what we tell you. People must be free to choose. When they choose, then they must be committed, of course, to what their decision and to the outcomes of the decision. Unfortunately, we don't have time to talk here about the concept of authority in Islam and I am sure you will may have lots of questions about that where does authority lie in Islam when it comes to politics and how do we look at the issue of democracy I cannot go into that because I have rest of my discussion about freedom but just I want to say basically Islam says every human being is free and equal and no one can force you to obey unless you yourself for some reason decide to accept, decide to commit yourself to a kind of agreement or contract or constitution or citizenship that is different. The other thing which I would love to talk is Freedom of behavior or individual freedom in the sense that, and I think this is the problem that we have today in modern society, are we free to do whatever we want? The liberal culture, especially uh, secular liberal culture in some modern societies, they say, okay, we should t uh, let people to do whatever they want. The only restriction is when they want to violate freedom of other people. So basically, you are free to do whatever you want, but just make sure you leave other people free. So for example, you may not be able to raise the sound of your for example, TV or radio, to the extent that your neighbor will be annoyed. But if the, water, uh, the, sorry, the walls are soundproof, you can raise it so much that make you mad. No problem. 
It's you and you are free. Just make sure that you don't annoy your neighbor. If you want to drink, you should not drive because you may then hurt other people. But if you are alone and you want to drink so much so that you would die or you would have fatal you know, illness problems, no problem. But make sure you don't cause extra cost for NHS. <laughs> but if you die, it's okay. If you don't come to the hospital, because this is the liberal culture. If you say people are free to do whatever they want, so this is, you cannot say why you drink. Yes, you shouldn't drive because it affects the society. You shouldn't expect free treatment in the hospital because you are affecting society. But if you are dying, very good. Especially if you cannot generate money for the society or create you know, jobs for the society, it's better if you die. This is the mentality. But what about Islamic mentality? Ayatollah Mutahari has beautiful discussion here. He says, and you, I think the discussion this, uh, that we had in our first course on self-knowledge very much, you know, uh, help us. That inside every human being, we have two aspects. We have reason or intellect, and we have our soul with lower desires, with lust, with whims, with wishes, which are mostly shared by animals. So, or if I can say our soul has, because you know we have three types of soul, one is the vegetative soul, which is shared with the plants as well, but let's focus on two higher levels of soul. We have animal soul and we have rational soul. As far as animal soul is concerned, so we have desire for food, for shelter, for opposite sex, for this kind of things, for many uh, things which are by themselves not bad. By themselves they are important and they are needed. But there is no limit as far as the animal soul is concerned. And this is why the Quran calls this Ammaratun Besu and Nafsala Ammaratun Besu. It always wants you more and more and more. But we have rational soul, we have our reason, our intellect, which is to guide, to direct, to regulate our other desires. In other words, you have different types of desires in human beings. Sometimes you have desires which are by themselves human and moral. Like what? Desire for knowledge. Desire for beauty. Desire for perfection. Desire for helping other people. These are human and valuable and moral desires. These are divine desires. You have also desire for food, desire for sex, desire for fame, desire for power. These desires are desires which are not by themselves moral, but they are not also immoral. It depends on the way you do it and on the limits. Okay? When you say human beings are free to do what they want, what they desire, so there is a very serious question here. Do you mean human beings are f to be left free to follow their lower desires, their animal desires, their desire for having control over others, having power, having money, having sex? They should be free to do whatever they want in this regard? Or 
you mean human beings must be free in following their real human desires desire for knowledge desire for moral excellence desire for being a benevolent human being which type of desire you mean our understanding and many religious people of course share with us this understanding it's not only we Muslims many religious people have this understanding that real freedom comes from within the person we must be able to do whatever is moral whatever is valuable whatever is really human whatever we are supposed to do neither internal forces nor external forces should stop us sometimes you have external forces this is very obvious like what like for example a person uh, for example a tyrant person or government uh, stops you to practice what is right what is morally okay this is external problem but sometimes you have internal problem you have been so much attached to your lower desires and so much you have weakened your will and determination that you can never resist any of your animal desires, any of your appetites, any of your loss. If you want to do something good, you feel that you are chained from inside. If like, you know, someone who is not generous, you know, he has lots of money, but when he wants to give money to other people, there is no external barrier. But inside, as if there are millions of people, they are keeping him firmly so that he doesn't spend this money. Or, you know, for example, when we are, you know, sleeping in the night, you know, and we are enjoying our sleep, then it is a time for prayer. So if someone is not trained, if someone has no determination, so he feels really the force which comes from inside to stop him saying his prayer, to stop him getting up. We need to liberate ourselves, not only from the external forces, but also from internal forces. Anything which wants to stand against human perfection is an obstacle. Whether it be other people, whether it be my own uneducated and untrained nafs or soul it makes no difference indeed the internal enemy is much more dangerous you remember we had this discussion in the second course that this is the most severe enemy the worst enemy that you have is your own soul which is not trained which is not purified and this is the greater struggle so this internal freedom or this spiritual freedom this is very important and we believe that if people have both types of freedom the spiritual freedom and also social freedom then people have the best opportunity to prosper from every aspect, materially, materially and spiritually, and have their salvation and happiness in this world and in the hereafter. If people don't have the freedom in society, then human talents will be wasted, and they will be ruled by the people or by the parties or by the groups that only want to secure their own interests, not the interests of humanity. And this is a problem. 
But if you have freedom in the society and don't have that spiritual freedom, still you don't make progress. You may make some progress in the material means, but not a real human progress. A real human progress must be comprehensive. We need freedom from every aspect. Freedom from tyrants, from oppressors, from unjust people, and also from satanic powers inside ourselves. This is the type of freedom that we want. And interestingly, the Quran says that one of the tasks of the prophets was to liberate people. One of the things that the Prophet was doing was to remove all the chains and locks that was, were put over the hands of the people and the feet of the people and the tongue and the mind and eyes and ears of the people. There are so many chains and locks which are put over contemporary human being that we don't notice. Do you think that we are really free to think? We are really free to vote for the people who are, you know, good? We are so much limited by propaganda, by the culture which is produced mostly by the people who are just after money. So that it's not really a matter of being free and being open. It's the power of religion, the power of faith that really can liberate a person because religion connects you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is infinite. Allah accepts no limit. If you can get connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you become free. Otherwise, anything less than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would limit you and would restrict you. So the, la the last point I want to make here is about taqwa. Is taqwa a restriction? Is piety something which restricts human freedom? Is observing your religious and your moral obligations something against your freedom? The answer is no. Not only it's not restriction, rather taqwa is protection of your freedom. Because by being a pious person, by being a committed follower of the faith, by being a true servant of God, then you secure your real and genuine interest in the best possible way. Taqwa is a liberating force. Taqwa tells you, don't be worried, don't be afraid of opposing the wrong and the wrongdoers. Taqwa tells you just be concerned with what is right and leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do what is right and don't worry. Say Allah, say God, and leave everything rest. The rest, everything, leave it and put it aside. Don't worry. This is very important. If you, we have taqwa, then we do what we are supposed to do. We do what we are required to do by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything good will come out of it. If we don't have taqwa, if we are fearful, if we are always afraid that by doing this or by saying this, I may, for example, lose money or I may lose, for example, reputation or my friends or my colleagues or my relatives may not admire me, this and this and this. Then you find your life very difficult because you want to please hundreds or thousands of people, which is impossible. 
pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is much easier than pleasing thousands of people. First of all, Allah is just one, but there is no limit in the number of other people. And second, Allah doesn't want us for his own sake. So, so if you please Allah, it means that you are pleasing yourself, not pleasing anyone else. So taqwa is not a restriction or limit. Taqwa is really a protection of human free will. I just, just would like to end with a story from the beginning of Islam. When the army of uh, you know, Islam, when they had encounter with the Iranians, so one of the chief commanders of the Islamic army was a person called Rostam. And the person who was, sorry, Islamic army was uh, Zahrat ibn Abdullah and the commander in Iranian army was Rostam. They had a conversation. The Iranian commander in chief asked the Muslim counterpart, what is your religion all about? What do you say? He said, we believe that there is no God but God, the only one God but Allah, and that Muhammad is his messenger. And we believe in the fact that whatever the Prophet brought is from God. So this Iranian commander-in-chief said, okay, this is not a problem. What else you believe? He said, we also believe that human beings must be free. They must not be forced to follow anyone other than God. We believe in the liberation of human beings. And I think that was something that those people couldn't tolerate because they were always asking people to be only concerned with their king. And you know the system which was in Iran at that time was very unjust and they had a very rigid hierarchical structure that people from certain classes of society couldn't have even education. So he was not that much, the Iranian commander was not that much uh, in problem with uh, accepting God and accepting the Prophet. The main problem is to liberate people. To tell people that you should not follow blindly those who have power. And I think this is again the problem today. If you are a Muslim and you believe in Islam, that's not a problem. If you want to be a little bit more clever and intelligent and say, I don't want to blindly follow those who have power, whether military power or power of media or you know politics or whatsoever, then they say, okay, this is a problem. You are not supposed to be after liberation of yourself or people. Okay, I I'll stop here. If you have questions, please uh, don't hesitate and put them forward. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Uh, and inshallah last week uh, would be our final session uh, so, sorry next week thank you next week will be our uh, final session brother amir will finish today because he had one extra session so next week we will have uh, one session but there is possibility of having one guest also so if possible please arrange in the way that you may be able to stay you know longer like usual not just one session but uh, uh, of course, if someone has other commitments, no problem. And then, inshallah, the next course will start uh, 
21st of October. So we thought that maybe you need some holiday and also then would be Ramadan so that people can attend, you know, majalis in Ramadan. So inshallah, the next course I have uh, also leaflets you can take. I start 21st of October, inshallah. And it would be, again, 3 p.m., but after a week, the time would be changed. It would be winter time, so it would be 2 o'clock. But the first week would be 3 o'clock. And the subject would be aqa'id, uh, uh, which would be about arguments for the existence of God, divine attributes and prophethood uh, by Sheikh Hakim Elahi. And second part of history, which would be from Imam Hassan to the occultation of Imam Mahdi, the tutor for history is not yet fixed. It will be announced later. Please also inform the people who may be interested. Any question? Yes, please. Yes. Backbiting means there is, a, of course, here a discussion among ulama, uh, and there are some differences in details. But basically, generally speaking, backbiting means to mention something about your brother or sister, okay, I mean brother, sister, faith, that he or she is not pleased with. And this, according to some people, may even include the good qualities of them, if they are not pleased to be known. But normally they restrict it to the bad qualities, or something that they take it to be bad. So for example, I say my brother, you know, or my, about my brother or sister in faith, that he did you know such a mistake or he has this quality he's a very angry person you know aggressive or jealous or whatsoever these are the things that may be really in him but just the fact that he is not present here to defend himself makes it a sin some people think that backbiting is only bad if what you say is wrong so when you, you know, tell people, please don't commit ghaybah, they say, I am telling the truth. Or some people say, I can say this even in his front. But this doesn't you know, solve the problem. As long as the person is absent and what you say is something which he doesn't want to be known by the people, this is backbiting and this is not allowed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. About philosophical, you know, this is about philosophical freedom. Yeah. Yeah. This is a very important question. We believe that our faith, F A T E, yeah. Our faith is known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in advance, but is not fixed in advance. So he knows in advance, but he doesn't fix it in advance. That so there is a difference between this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with freedom. So I am free, other people are free. And my faith is very much dependent on the interaction between my freedom and freedom of people and the forces of the nature and many, many factors. It's not fixed. So we can always try to improve. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows in advance what is going to happen because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not limited to past, present, future. For him there is no timing. Our present is as present to him as our future and as our past. And this is something that we find it even in our own 
you know experience that sometimes you know something is going to happen but you have not uh, co you are not controlling it for example you know that tomorrow would be monday you know in advance but you are not making monday monday you are not making sun you know to come tomorrow or for example sometimes if you have a very you know lazy student who doesn't study at all who doesn't learn anything so you know that he would fail but it's not because you know he is going to fail it's because he's going to fail you know in advance okay so he cannot come and say why did you know that I am going to fail because you knew I am I have failed okay so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows in advance, but he doesn't fix. He has left it open to us so that we exercise our freedom. But we should also be, you know, modest. We should know that it's not that everything is in our control. As I said, it depends very much on my freedom with freedom of other people, with the uh, forces which are there in the nature many things are not in our hand but still there is great space for us we have so many talents that if we really you know cultivate those talents we can overcome any obstacle for our perfection so no human being is excused by saying that I was not free or I was not able to be a good person but people can say we had problems we had difficult time yes okay so we accept that you may be maybe in a very difficult time you may have lots of problems but still you can manage and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would take into account all your difficulties so if in a very difficult situation you take one step forward that would be like a person who takes one, uh, ten steps.